Hey everyone, this is Charlie Shrem, and you're listening to Untold Stories. This is a show where we dive deep into the lives and personal histories of some of crypto's most influential leaders and find out how the crypto movement truly came to be. Let's dive in. Are there many politicians on Twitter who are willing to say that they are crypto enthusiasts? No, of course not. Very little. So you can imagine how excited I was when I met a few years ago my guest today, Memli Krasniki. Memli is an extremely young Kosovar politician, I think he's like the same age as my wife actually, who has been the vice president of the Democratic Party of Kosovo since February 2013. Memli has previously been the Minister of Agriculture, Forestry and Rural Development from 2014 to 2017. He was the Minister of Culture, Youth and Sports from 2011 to 2014, and currently He's the chairman of the PDK caucus in the Assembly of Kosovo. I should also mention that Memli is very active in youth and sports. And being young himself, he likes to make sure that he represents the younger generation in Kosovo. And on that note, he's very involved in its country's Olympic committee as well. So let's talk a little about Kosovo for a second. 20 years ago, Kosovo fought for its liberation against Serbia and won. Bill Clinton was very much a part of this process, being the American president at the time, he really pushed American interests to fight for Kosovo. And because of that, Kosovo has such an American-friendly attitude and modern infrastructure. This allowed Memli to buy Bitcoin when it was less than $200 many years ago. We had some really cool topics that we talked about today. We talked about Bitcoin and crypto, of course. But what was really cool, we talked about what it was like actually building a country. How do you build a country? How do you build infrastructure in in 20 years? How do you do that? And then how do you create cool policies that allow people to get excited about that? So for example, we talked about how Kosovo has a maximum tax rate of just 10% and how its economy in the past 20 years is now well established that it's comparable to other European economies. And as a business growth country, Kosovo has many advantages from freedom, to good, low taxes, and even a statue of Bill Clinton himself. So right after the ads, we're going to talk to Memli Krasniki, who's going to tell us about his amazing country. I'm so honored that Untold Stories is sponsored by eToro. eToro is the smartest crypto trading platform and one of the largest in the world with over a trillion dollars in trading volume per year. What I really love about eToro is that the CEO has been around the Bitcoin space since 2012, so they really, really put their money where their mouths are. US customers, myself included, we can trade the most popular crypto assets, in fact, almost all of the ones that you wanna trade with low but transparent fees. So you actually know what you're paying for everything. And that's really, really, really important. So if you're not ready to trade yet, you can practice building your portfolio with the eToro $100,000 virtual trading feature. So you can create this whole portfolio without trading with any real money to see how you'll do. And you can learn all the different ins and outs without using any real money yet. And then once you're comfortable, you can enter the market and start buying and selling crypto for real. Best of all, one of my favorite features is that you can connect with 11 million other eToro traders in the world, myself included. And we can talk trading, charts, and all things crypto. So listen, head on over to eToro.com. Links are in the show notes and build your crypto portfolio the smart way. I want to thank and give credit to the first ever sponsor of Untold Stories, Scott Offer. Scott is a Bitcoin mining consultant. And I really want you guys to check out one of his coolest apps that's free to use, It's a Bitcoin mining profitability calculator that you can check it out before you get involved in mining or if you just want to learn more about whether mining is profitable and how it works. The website is CryptoMining.Tools. That's CryptoMining.Tools. You can enter your estimated uptime and get more realistic profit projections. It includes really cool features like the impact of the Bitcoin block reward having, which is actually coming up extremely soon. Their API allows you to embed profitability calculators and other live data directly into your own website, all for free. Also, if you're wondering which miner is the most efficient or has the best chance of breaking even, 
you should try out their interactive hardware comparison chart. So it's a hardware comparison chart. So you can compare all different types of miners for all different coins and tokens. And it's interactive. So you can play around with it. It's by far the best tool if you have any questions about mining or if you want to learn more about mining, it's the best tool you can check it out. As a mining consultant, Scott helps you make data-backed business decisions. He will be involved in the process if you want to buy a miner, if you want to sell a miner, if you have miners and need to get into data centers. I mean, if you follow Scott on Twitter, even if you're not in the mining industry, you learn so much. I follow him. It's super cool. You can check it out on Twitter or Telegram at Offered Scott. That's O-F-F-O-R-D-S-C-O-T-T. That's O-F-F-O-R-D-S-C-O-T-T. Again, I want to give a special thanks to Scott. You were my first sponsor when the show was just launching. Thank you so much. Untold Stories wouldn't be here without the amazing production company, Blockworks Group. A few months ago, I approached Blockworks Group and I said, Hey guys, I want to do a show, Untold Stories. Can we make it happen? And these guys are the only event and podcast production company that I trust. Really, the show is powered by them and it wouldn't be here today without the amazing work of the BlockWorks Group team. So for access to all the premier digital asset conferences and to check out their other podcasts in their network that they produce, check them out at BlockWorksGroup.io. That's BlockWorksGroup.io. I promise you will not be disappointed. Over the course of this show and over the course of the past decade in crypto, we're always talking and learning about this space from our side. We're learning about the space from what we perceive. And we look at this big, bad government, you know, entities as the negative and our enemy. But what we fail to remember and fail to realize is that most of the time there are people in governments, there are people in various parts of the world that actually like crypto and understand how important that is. And we're very fortunate to have today uh, a personal, very good friend of mine, Memli Krasniki, who currently is the vice president of the Democratic Party of Kosovo, and over the course of his political life has been the minister of agriculture, forestry, and rural development. He's the minister of culture, youth, and sports. And um, currently, he leads the charge of Kosovo being able to join the European Union. And I want to say congratulations because a few days ago, Kosovo celebrated its 20 years of independence so, Memli, welcome to the show and congratulations. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure to be uh, on your podcast. It's been it's been a crazy past 72 hours for you. You've been hanging out with Bill Clinton. Yeah. You've been uh, welcoming all foreign diplomats from all over the world. You've had all these amazing festivities. And it's such a wonderful thing. I mean, I can't even imagine what that would be like to be a part of. But how do you feel? What's, what emotions are you feeling right now? Honestly, Charlie, it's, uh, I think uh, it's very difficult to put it in words, the uh, emotions that uh, I had, but I think every citizen of Kosovo had during the past uh, few days, uh, uh, basically celebrating and remembering the uh, 20th uh, anniversary of our liberation. Uh, in June 12, 1999, uh, the war in Kosovo ended and uh, the international NATO troops led by the United States uh, troops entered Kosovo and together with the troops of the Kosovo Liberation Army basically were the, the victors of a, a terrible war uh, in which uh, our people suffered for a very long time, but particularly during 1998 and 1999. Uh, and notwithstanding the fact that Kosovo was uh, almost completely destroyed during that time most of uh, more than 60 percent of the people of Kosovo we were expelled out of our uh, country and more than 75 percent of all buildings were demolished nevertheless the the, the 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 freedom that we finally had the liberation that happened was the most amazing uh, thing that we have experienced so every time there is a uh, a commemoration and anniversary, and particularly uh, something as important as the twentieth year of of uh, that important day, definitely brings a lot of memories back. Uh, but uh, first and foremost, a lot of appreciation for the people that you know sacrificed so much, even gave their lives for that day. But also to 
uh, or uh, international friends and, and partners. And uh, first and foremost in Kosovo, that is the United States of America and the people that led that charge for um, helping Kosovo. Uh, and at that time was the 42nd U.S. President uh, Bill Clinton, uh, Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, uh, the NATO uh, Commander-in-Chief uh, Wesley Clark, but many other people like Tony Blair, the, the, the former U.K. Prime Minister, and a lot of others. Uh, so it was uh, uh, absolutely uh, uh, spectacular to be able to welcome them back to Kosovo, Mr. Clinton, uh, Madam Albright, General Clark. Uh, to be here with us uh, in this 20th uh, anniversary of our freedom. Uh, particularly for me, uh, I mean, uh, at the personal level, it was uh, amazing to be able to meet Bill Clinton, to, to, to talk to him, to spend uh, some time with him. And uh, uh, it was amazing because uh, I know sometimes when I speak to talk to my American friends, uh, they find it very difficult to understand that you know, Kosovo is officially on the record the most pro-American country in the world uh, and uh, that uh, people of Kosovo just love uh, uh, U.S. leaders, uh, you know, on both sides of the aisle, you know, be it Democratic leaders or Republicans, because they've had always a very bipartisan approach with regards to supporting Kosovo and supporting our people. I want to get into some subjects in a little bit about crypto, and I want to talk about what it's been like to start sure. to, to basically in the past 20 years um, form a new a new country. I mean, inform financial services and banking. And I want to get into that in a second. But before I do, and this is going off topic a little bit, I think there's one very important, two very important points to as an American that I see why Kosovo is so important for us to to commemorate and to remember. There's two reasons. One. There hasn't been a lot of success stories as it relates to NATO and the UN when being able to to help out another country just strictly for 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 moral reasons. I mean, you look at so many of the times when NATO and UN led troops didn't help out. You know, you look at Rwanda, for example, and then you look at things like Somalia and Bill Clinton will never forget what had happened there. But <clears throat> excuse me. But I think the the more important point, and I don't see it getting enough attention in the media, and that's why I want to point it out today. The more important thing to to that needs to be talked about with Kosovo is that majority majority Muslim countries get a very bad rap in the media today, and Americans are jaded, and the Western world is very jaded. Whenever you hear of a of a of a country that's majority Muslim, um, it gets a very negative view. And we think of third world countries, we think of non-democracies, we think of um, it's in our heads, it's on the media, it's in our textbooks. And that's a very, very, very big problem because Kosovo is, is a success story and you're largely extremely democratic and you have some wonderful people. And that's something that needs to be talked about more. Well, I. I agree, Charlie, but, you know, in the media, uh, usually it's the bad press uh, and the bad news that get a lot of attention. That is basically the nature of uh, the uh, media, particularly in the last 20, 30 years with the, you know, uh, growth of technology and the, the whole development that uh, we've had globally. Uh, uh, the fact is that Kosovo is the most successful um, case of international intervention. There's been, uh, there have been other international, internationally led uh, interventions uh, uh, in in various other parts of the world. Uh, but everybody agrees that the best um, uh, the, the example, the success story is Kosovo, and that's true because uh, the intervention here, led by the U.S., uh, stopped the genocide. Uh, made it possible for more than a million people to come back to the, to their homeland, to their homes, rebuild uh, the society and basically uh, rebuild a, a country and create a, a new independent country with, you know, a fully fledged, with everything uh, that an independent and sovereign country has. 
Uh, plus the fact that Kosovo is a very young country in terms of its population. I mean, about 55% of uh, Kosovo's people are 35 and younger, which has been actually uh, the the strongest uh, uh, arm that we have. I mean, that has been uh, the, the most important uh, uh, capital uh, for our country. It was the people that had, you know, felt, the existence of perspective for the future that felt a sense of duty uh, to contribute for the rebuilding of uh, of the country. I mean, I remember in '99, all these uh, international organizations had plans of you know bringing probably not the whole one million, but maybe seven hundred thousand people in the next five years. Fact of the matter is that ninety percent came back in the next seven weeks uh, because everybody just wanted to come back and you know try to. To, to do with job and rebuilding the country. Uh, on the other hand, uh, with regards to the uh, pro-Americanism of uh, of Kosovo, that is very natural. I mean, uh, notwithstanding the fact that majority population of Kosovo is is Muslim, the fact of the matter is this: that uh, for us uh, growing up, usually the the most important. Uh, identity was our national ethnic identity being Albanian and uh, as as a peoples we have different faiths and religions uh, I mean there's Muslims there's Catholic Christians there's uh, Orthodox Christians there's uh, also Protestants and also Bektashi Sunni Muslims uh, 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 Bektashi Sufi Muslims uh, so f- to us this multi-religion religious uh, harmony has been part of our lives uh, and Kosovo as a country is a, is a secular country which provides for the you know highest level of respect uh, of uh, you know all human rights uh, religious included, um, but um, uh, definitely to come back to your to your uh, main point, uh, it is a success story, and uh, it doesn't get a lot of rap or a lot of coverage because it's a success story. If it was not successful, I'm pretty sure it'd be in the news. So sometimes, you know, the good uh, news is that you're not in the news at all. You know, that's what my lawyer says. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, mostly uh, you can relate to that from your personal experience, probably. Tell me, tell me what it was like growing up. Tell me, I know you studied at London School of Economics, so you have a very good understanding of and a grasp of economics. But tell me what it was like growing up for you and some of the, you know, how you remember specific memories in your childhood. You know, you'll you won't remember span like. For some reason, there are spans of my life that you just don't remember from 10 to 15 years old or 10 to 18 years old. I have no memory of some of the stuff. But then there are those certain memories that are so vivid in your life because they are pivotal in what made who you are. What are some of those memories growing up for you? Well, I'm one of the Xennials, you know, in between the Generation X and and, and the Millennials. I was born in, in 1980. Uh, so I'm a kid of the nineties. And so let's say my first decade, you don't remember much, uh, uh, but the Kosovo, uh, in 90, since 1989 was in, uh, in deep trouble, you know, Serbia effectively occupied Kosovo with police troops and an army, uh, suspended all institutions that Kosovo had before as an autonomous entity in former Yugoslavia. Uh, we were kicked out of our schools. Our parents were kicked out of their jobs. We basically lived a parallel life uh, under the threat of, you know, physical existence. Uh, so definitely that has shaped all of us. That has shaped us as as persons. And uh, that's why I think we, we grew up, especially my generation, we grew up with, uh, you know, a want of uh, liberty, of a want of freedom, a want of being able to pursue dreams. Now, the 90s were uh, a time of uh, a, a huge transitions all over Europe, probably all over the world. But in Kosovo, we were facing, uh, I mean, we were definitely affected by the transition uh, after the fall of the Berlin Wall in terms of politics, in terms of change, also in terms of, you know, the, the uh, technological revolution. Uh, but we were faced with something far more terrible, which was our you know, physical threat, threat to our physical existence. 
uh, and nevertheless, you know, in that sort of parallel uh, uh, universe that the uh, Albanians in Kosovo were trying to organize themselves and, and their lives, parallel schooling, parallel health, uh, parallel tax collection, you name it. Um, you know, we tried to live a normal life. So obviously we were exposed to what was happening in the world, not to the extent that everybody is today, but uh, some of the things that were important were, for example, the onset of satellite dishes. Like if you be in Pristina and the cities in Kosovo in the 90s, you'd see all apartment buildings lined up with uh, satellite dishes because almost everybody would save all the money they had to, to be able to have uh, access to, um, you know, uh, international uh, TV channels. Why? It was it was very important in the, in the 90s. Why? Because uh, uh, like with the schools, like with the, you know, hospitals, like with everything else, uh, Serbia also closed down our media. They closed our radio stations, the TV stations, those few that existed. So uh, the, 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 the drive was to be able to, you know, watch uh, what was going out in the West and not be, you know, uh, uh, exposed only to the Serbian propaganda uh, of that time. That was helpful, actually, in many ways, because that helped a lot of people to learn uh, first and foremost languages. So we you know, a lot of people would watch, you know, the the German TV uh, uh, channels and those uh, satellite channels, and a lot of people learn German, a lot of people learn English, a lot of people learn other languages. Nevertheless, in the 90s, a lot of people left Kosovo, young people left uh, in the beginning because they were uh, avoiding conscription into U Yugoslav army, which was waging wars in Croatia and in 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 Bosnia. Uh, and a lot of others left for economic reasons because, you know, it was uh, hard to survive without being able to have a job or, or, or economic uh, opportunities. Uh, and that was also helpful because this, the sizable diaspora that Kosovo has has been helping uh, in, through, through, through uh, their remittances, was helping people in Kosovo, you know, get by, you know, create small businesses and, and what have you. But uh, I mentioned the satellite dishes uh, because this is how we were, you know, probably originally exposed to what was going on in the West, in the U.S., in, in Europe, in terms of, you know, music, in terms of, I don't know, fashion, films, uh, politics, everything else. And that obviously played a role uh, in, in, in shaping up uh, every one of us. And uh, by coincidence, it all obviously also uh, reinforced the um, Western-oriented uh, identity that uh, Albanians have, because we were, uh, let's say, threatened on one side by the, the Eastern um, Slavic uh, influence or, 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 or uh, oppression uh, from Serbia, which was related to Russia, you know, all that former communist uh, uh, stream. And then we had Europe on the side, which was our, our uh, perspective, which was, you know, our, uh, what we were striving for in the United States. And uh, that has definitely been very important for the, uh, let's say, the general mindset of the, uh, of the Kosovo people and also the, the, the politics and everything, because that has no alternative for us. And you know allegiances, if uh, I, can, I, I can call them like that, uh, were always undisputably on the on the West because we were always you know felt European, Western oriented, and so we have it. So yeah, technology has played uh, an important role, and it did also uh, after the liberation, uh, since you know internet spread out. You know there were new ISPs in the country and. Since '99, you know everybody was trying to get connected and uh, and what have you. And you know, I'm happy to say that, for example, the last Eurostat report puts Kosovo uh, on the map. Uh, not on the, only on the map, but Kosovo has, for example, 95% internet internet penetration rate, uh, uh, mostly broadband, and that's like Germany, France, and you know more. Uh, more than uh, most of the European Union countries. 
uh, this connection with technology, with um, information technology and communication has been uh, important in terms of development of our society and it still is one of the you know uh, strong uh, factors in Kosovo. You look at you look at 20 years and it's a very small number 20 years. For example, um if we're taking examples of newer countries that have been founded over the past 100 years for example, take take um <clears throat> take take Israel for example. Israel is a very new country, you know, 60 70 years or whatever it is. Yeah. And now it's a success story in terms of their economy. However, and everyone everyone knows around the world they they it's success their economy highest GDP university rates. But let me tell you something: twenty years after their independence, they still had dirt roads. So it takes it takes time. It takes time for these things, and so it is very great to see how far you've come. But I think what I want to know, and what our listeners want to know is how do you build, you know, let me take a step back for a second. The, su- the success to any country is its infrastructure for its citizens. So you have a huge workforce that is um, young. And that is a huge, huge thing that most countries can contribute to their success. Their younger workforce. And that's very important. But infrastructure is equally, if not more important. In the past 20 years, how have you been able to build a financial services uh, industry, an information technology industry, and the ability for people to um, send and receive money for, from and to Kosovo and also be able to start trading with other countries around the world, especially since I know you're trying to get into the European Union but and you're not there yet, but you're, you're on your way. But in, in 20 years, how have you been able to build that infrastructure that countries have, it has taken other countries hundreds of years to build. That is true, Charlie. But I think also what helped is the fact that, you know, uh, starting a, a country uh, in, you know, 2000, uh, late 99, and starting one in 45 in the case of Israel was very different contexts globally, but also in terms of development and technology and all that. Uh, nevertheless, um, I think there are many elements to that. One uh, that needs to be mentioned is the, the the great help that Kosovo had from the international community, uh, be it through donations, through expertise, consultancy, uh, technical uh, advice, and all of that. But also, uh, and I think most importantly, due to the uh, uh, sheer will of the people in Kosovo to uh, have a country of their own and to have a, 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 a stable uh, state where they want to live and build their, their, their lives. Now, if I go back to 20 years ago, when war just ended, uh, Kosovo was very much underdeveloped uh, because even when it was under Yugoslavia, it was, it, it, it was always seen as hostile because Albanians are different people uh, in all ways from from the majority of the Slavic peoples that created Yugoslavia in terms of history, ethnicity, language, traditions, and all of that. So we were like always subjugated to a second class citizen status. And that came also with the fact of, you know, not investing in the country. So even the, the, the infrastructure in terms of like uh, roads and schools and buildings and all of that was not developed at all uh so after the war you know it was important to to do that uh if you you know come and see kosovo now i'm i'm happy to say that you know we have probably the most not probably we have the most modern motorways in all of balkans i mean we have the longest bridge in all of balkans we have you know our, our, our motorways are built by american and turkish world class companies uh our villages don't uh, look nothing like they were 15 20 years ago you know it's uh, it's because it's a small country in terms of size i think that was also uh, also helpful in that sense but we've invested quite a lot particularly in the last 10 years in in developing and upgrading our infrastructure, also because we believe that you need to have 
these basic needs covered before you actually move on to to bigger projects. The same applies to the financial sector, to the banking sector. I mean, we have a very stable banking sector. It's very liberal. It's open. What does that mean? Uh, we've been we've we've been the only economy in uh, the region, and I think one of the only four economies globally uh, to not have uh, a recession or stagnation since the the economic uh, crisis, since the financial meltdown in two thousand eight and nine. Even throughout that time, we had a steady average. Uh, economic growth uh, of four percent. Do you attribute that? Oh yes. Do you do you attribute that because of your more free market policies? Uh, we, I, I think, what are, our policies were were I think on point because what helped was heavy public investment in infrastructure, uh, and also the fact that as a smaller economy uh, and a smaller in size banking sector, we were not exposed. Uh, to to uh, to the problems uh, of you know bigger uh, uh, bigger economies and uh, and the, the eurozone uh, in in general, uh, but uh, that was very important uh, due to the fact that we we uh, what what we might have lost uh, during the the that those first few years is oppor- we we probably lost some more opportunities to grow our economy economy further uh but nevertheless four percent is 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 okay uh especially when you consider that every country in the region had negative growth they had uh, they had recession uh when i spoke about the banks you asked what i mean i mean we have a we have a, a very much uh, our banking sector like every other regulation in the country is mostly based in eu rules uh, their uh, legislation, their directives and regulations. Uh, they have to be uh, compliant to, to what the EU has because Kosovo, like other countries in the region, uh, wants to become one day member of the European Union. So, you know, the homework that you have to do starts early on and you need to uh, comply with whatever happens in, in the EU. And obviously every year it becomes more difficult because to join EU 20 years ago, you had much less paperwork, much less legislation to adopt, and then that has been growing year after year. Uh, and in that sense, uh, we, for example, in Kosovo, we use euros. We don't have our own uh, currency. We we use the, 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 the euros as national currency, which has, in essence, made uh, uh, impossible for Kosovo, Kosovo to have its own monetary policy. I don't see that as negative at all. Uh, because we are not exposed to the risks of, you know, having high inflation like some of the countries in, uh, in the region. Uh, but uh, apart from that, we've been able to have our own uh, economic and, and financial uh, policies, uh, which are very uh, much friendly to, you know, market economy and business. We have a genuine a free market economy. We're part of, you know, regional free market um, uh, agreements, and uh, so we also have the most liberal tax uh, system in the region, if not in Europe, probably in Europe. Too. I'm curious about that. Tell me about your tax system and and why you think it's good. Well, uh, at the business level or the entrepreneurial level, or profit tax is ten percent. So you know whatever you can uh, you can gain only ten percent is uh, the duty to the to the state, um, and also we have no dividend tax. For example, uh, many countries in the region or in Europe they would probably charge an average of thirty or more percent to begin with as a profit tax, as a corporate tax, and then charge you the dividend tax on top of that. We don't have that. We have a flat ten percent uh, corporate uh, tax, and uh, that is obviously very attractive for businesses. Also, in a personal, individual level, uh, the salary taxes are uh, scaled. They start at four percent, and the highest is ten percent. So, if you get anything above wow. um, five hundred euros, uh, you get ten percent uh, tax. So, you, if you get five thousand euros. You still get only ten percent 
uh, as a salary tax. Uh, there's also a lot of in incentives for businesses. And uh, we were, you know, continuing to make uh, this, uh, the, the doing business environment uh, more friendly, not only for the local investors, but also for, um, you know, uh, foreign uh, direct investment. Uh, uh, the World Bank has this yearly doing business uh, in the world report, which they, where they evaluate the, the countries, about 200 of them globally. And uh, in the last few years, Kosovo has been scoring around the, the 40th place. So, you know, for a young country, it's not bad to be in the top 40 countries in the world to in, in terms of, you know, doing business and uh, being business friendly uh, as a country. I think there's still uh, uh, a lot to do, uh, but, you know, it's encouraging to be able to, you know, score, score well and be recognized for, uh, for these uh, achievements. I'm so honored that Untold Stories is sponsored by eToro. eToro is the smartest crypto trading platform and one of the largest in the world with over a trillion dollars in trading volume per year. What I really love about eToro is that the CEO has been around the Bitcoin space since 2012, so they really, really put their money where their mouths are. U.S. customers, myself included, we can trade the most popular crypto assets, in fact, almost all of the ones that you want to trade with low but transparent fees. So you actually know what you're paying for everything. And that's really, really, really important. So if you're not ready to trade yet, you can practice building your portfolio with the eToro $100,000 virtual trading feature. So you can create this whole portfolio without trading with any real money to see how you'll do. And you could learn all the different ins and outs without using any real money yet. And then once you're comfortable, you could enter the market and start buying and selling crypto for real. Best of all, one of my favorite features is that you can connect with 11 million other eToro traders in the world, myself included. And we can talk trading, charts, and all things crypto. So listen, head on over to eToro.com Links are in the show notes and build your crypto portfolio the smart way. I'd like to thank my sponsor of Untold Stories, Scott Offord. Scott is a Bitcoin mining consultant and provides managed miner hosting services in Texas. If you need to get at least 25 megawatts of miners online in the next three months, Scott wants to talk with you right now. Contact him on Telegram or Twitter at OFFORD. S-C-O-T-T. -T. He's offering an all-in rate of 6.5 cents per kilowatt an hour. Wow, that's like super cheap. That's like electricity cost in the Arctic where things are automatically cooled because it's so cold. So he's offering 6.5 cents per kilowatt an hour without any CapEx required. Or if you commit to $170,000 per megawatt up front, he can get you a rate of $0.05 cents per kilowatt. Am I reading that right? $0.05 cents per kilowatt? That's unbelievable. Scott can get your first 25 megawatt hashing within 16 weeks from the date of signing. All the infrastructure, power lines, substations, water lines, and buildings are fully owned by the hosting company. By the end of March 2020, they will already have 150 megawatts online in Texas. This is such a super cool ad to record because... My listeners are learning about mining now. Like this is this is really interesting. I I didn't even know half this half this stuff before I met Scott and he started sponsoring the show. So make sure you check out Scott on Telegram and Twitter at o f f o r d s c o t t. And Scott, thank you again for being my first ever Untold Story sponsor. The question on everyone's mind, because you talk to diplomats, you talk to um, many governments around the world. Are governments, are governments accumulating cryptocurrency? Well, I don't know the answer to that. But if I would be in charge uh, to decide uh, for my government, I would definitely instruct <laughs> the governor of a central bank uh, to put at least some of the money aside and, and invest in crypto. Well, that's a that's an important answer because you're you are of the younger generation. You are of the next wave of of high level politicians around the world. And most of them, especially here in the United States, are saying the same thing. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to hear that. Tell me how you 
learned about crypto and about Bitcoin and why it was so intriguing for you? I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. But look, I mean, okay. the, uh, the, the governments, they invest in, uh, in bonds, they invest in, you know, all these uh, instruments, which are important. And the fact is that they have they have some tradition, they have some stability, they have some, uh, there's a lot of knowledge about how they work. Uh, the, the, the government, in essence, is a conservative instrument. And that's why it's sometimes hard for governments to adopt uh, to new things. Whereas crypto is not yet as stable uh, from a, you know, a minister, finance minister's perspective. That's why they would be hesitant. In one way, you can't really blame them because it's, um, it's a huge responsibility to decide about the peop- you know, people's money. At the end of the day, the money that governments have or money that they take from the people that they govern. So it's the taxes that, that we all pay and we give to the government to provide these services. So a responsible government needs to be quite sure with regards to you know how they invest that and how they protect that. But I still maintain my position that I would still, you know, small chunks invest, start, because that would have cyclic effects in the uh, adoption of the crypto uh, to the masses why because i think if you if if, uh, if the people would you know know uh, understand and accept that even their own governments are investing in the cryptocurrencies then they would probably trust the cryptocurrencies more and i think that the um, adoption you know having uh, a more massive uh, adoption of the crypto will uh, definitely be the future but if it happens sooner it would be better how i got involved with crypto it's uh, well you know uh, i started hearing about bitcoin years ago uh, i don't even know how probably i just stumbled across in the internet and might have been first time maybe in 2013 uh so a few years back didn't understand much about it to have no background in cryptography so you know uh, what i would do i would google bitcoin uh, there were not many resources back then so you either would see some forums which were quite technical for me or you would get the white paper of satoshi and then I would open the white paper and start reading. And in the first paragraph, I would lose myself because I, would, I wasn't really understanding much. I think we all did. I would understand the concept of, you know, peer-to-peer electronic cash. It's, uh, it, it was at the time when, you know, uh, file sharing peer-to-peer was popular all over the world. So, you know, it, it, it made sense uh, in that basic understanding to be able to, you know, share money to spend you know send money and receive money in the same way that you would you know send or receive an mp3 uh, or, a, or 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 an mpeg file uh, but i didn't really understand much so you know i i wouldn't pursue it but i would come back to it maybe you know every other month or so and i would look at it again uh, and feeling that i'm not really you know, um, competent uh, uh, about about this, I sort of started asking a friend of mine, say, you know, look into this because he had a banking background. But because he had a banking background, he was conservative. So, you know, he didn't trust much. And, you know, back then, I think uh, it might have been 2014 then. Uh, back then, I, I, I'm not sure. The Bitcoin price was less than 200 bucks, maybe 150. So I was like, dude, let's just, Whatever happens, let's just buy 10 Bitcoin each. We, we have that money to invest. And just, let's just uh, think that, you know, we invest this and we lose. But you know, if it, if it uh, you know, increases in price, then we make a profit. Uh, and myself, I was be- uh, then I was um, a minister uh, uh, in the Ministry of Culture, Youth and Sport. I, I had my plate was full, you know, trying to, to get uh Kosovan athletes and federations to be able to compete internationally and be recognized by the international olympic committee and other federations and this and that so i didn't really have a lot of time to 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 be focused on that then we had some some 
uh, standoff between, you know, the coalition after the new elections and the opposition, some cases in the constitutional court. And then I ca- I would come back to, 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 to the cryptocurrencies. Then I found out about the new cryptocurrencies. I, I tried to buy my first whatever, Bitcoin or, or uh, Ether, or actually I tried to buy my first Dash in 2014, I think, or early 15. But uh, uh, I wasn't able to sign up in in the exchanges that were existing back then from Kosovo. So I tried to buy either through PayPal. Eventually, they would ask me for a wallet address. I didn't even know what a wallet address is. I would look for wallets. They Everything I found was just hardware. So everything sort of complicated me. And then eventually, uh, you know, uh, I bought my first Bitcoin in three years ago, exactly at, <laughs> at this time. Uh, but I've had before just, you know, buying and I, I've already, you know, started gaining some knowledge, uh, moving from the cryptographic aspect, which I didn't understand much to the actual ideological, what I would call the ideological aspect of, of, uh, a cryptocurrency as a some somewhat liberating instrument, uh, from, uh, from the current system, uh, in place everywhere. And, and it jives with your mentality of freedom and liberty and exactly individual and I, I, success. I mean, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, my ideological background, I, I I have I wouldn't you know label myself in only one camp, but I I have convictions that are you know very close to libertarians. But I also have liberal values. I also have some conservative values when in terms of you know values that I put in towards family, towards, you know, tradition, uh, and what have you. So, uh, you know, even even this, uh, let's call it a bit of a libertarian uh, approach to uh, to the financial markets for me was, was you know, intriguing. So all of this, oh, I, I've already accum- accumulated some lo- knowledge, read about, you know, different uh, uh, ideas behind and uh, I, I was intrigued. I, I sort of became converted. I, <laughs> I, I believed in the in the potential of uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrency to uh, do good in the world. You know, and uh, I, it was difficult back then uh, because not many people, if at all, uh, in this region in in Western Balkans, uh, spoke about Bitcoin. There were probably people, you know. Uh, in front of their uh, computers uh, doing something about Bitcoin, but they were isolated or maybe just uh, there was not a community. So uh, when I started talking about Bitcoin, although I was in, let's say, prominent positions in the government, uh, and uh, even when I would talk to people, they would look at me with, you know, doubt, uh, with uh, not understanding much. Uh, but, uh, you know, step by step, uh, other people were doing the same thing. And, uh, you know, it, it, in Kosovo, uh, a crypto community was, you know, very naturally created eventually. And a lot of people got involved in, in with it and especially, especially young people. So now it's, uh, like I think in most, most places in the world, it's something very, very natural. And you have a lot of people that, you know, uh, want to become traders, small scale, but they still, you know, buy and sell. You know, they 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 teach themselves to do TA. They uh, follow the trends and you know the speculations and are part of the you know cryptoverse in Twitter and in social media. And it's it's good. It's nothing like it was three or four years ago. But it's growing. Oh, absolutely. Yes, I mean it's growing so- because. Uh, as I said, we have so many young people, so you know it's uh, it's much easier to talk to young people about these uh, these things. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of companies around the world that are working in the in the crypto and blockchain space, in the Bitcoin crypto and blockchain space. Uh, these companies um, they jurisdiction shop. They look for friendly countries that have that are in that that they're looking for friendly countries. And that have um, a young, uh, smart English-speaking workforce. They're looking for countries where the governments are 
uh, unbureaucratic and open and friendly. They're looking for banking and they're looking for centrally located countries where it'd be easier for their executives to travel around. It seems like Kosovo checks off this list um, and is probably one of the best. So for those those executives at companies that are listening to this show, and I know there are a lot of them, what type of reception would they get if they decided to relocate to Kosovo? You've already, you've already sold me on the tax rate because that is unbelievable. But what other reception would they get if they wanted to move and hire a staff of, of, of your citizens of Kosovars? Well, uh, thank you for pointing that out, Charlie. The, it, it's true that Kosovo checks out most, if not all, of those uh, very important features that uh, a company, and especially crypto-related companies, need. Uh, the only challenge that not only us, but everyone has, uh, is being able to uh, convince the banking sector to follow suit. And this hasn't been uh, easy anywhere. I've been following with a lot of interest what Malta was doing with their crypto legislation, Bermuda on the other part of the globe. Uh, And, you know, you may have good legislation, very friendly and welcoming and all of that. But then the crypto companies, they need banking. And banking is, I think, the, the, the challenging bit that all of us have. Um, but you're in the government. You're friends with the governor of the central bank. Absolutely. I was the, one of the people that elected him because that's uh, uh, part of our uh, responsibility in the parliament. Uh, but uh, the fact is, in a, in a democratic country, you can't just impose rules uh, upon, in this case, banks. I think that we need to do, as I'm, I will call it the crypto community, notwithstanding if we're just we're developers, entrepreneurs, people in the government, is to try to explain and raise awareness and lobby and hopefully convince the banks that this will be for their benefit too in the future. And I think, you know, that's a bit of an uphill battle, but there will be banks, there will be banks that will start doing this first and that would definitely be, I think, in the in the lead, but well, that's at least my my uh, conviction. On the other hand, uh, Kosovo has, as you said, a lot of young people. Virtually everyone speaks very good English. Uh, virtually everyone is connected and, and on smartphones and broadband. And uh, a lot of people are, you know, um, uh, developing apps and software and working. Uh, for companies abroad from from Kosovo outsourcing their work. Actually, it's one of the few things that we have uh, a a, a positive trade balance is services, and especially ICT services. Uh, We have a lot of uh, innovative uh, youth uh, and uh, a lot of um, uh, innovative uh, innovation projects uh, that have support from the government and also from the non-governmental sector. Uh, we have a, a, an amazing center in Kosovo, the Innovation Center of Kosovo, which have, has become a success story uh, not only in this region, but also globally. They've, they've supported some very, very innovative um, projects which have gone on, uh, moved on to, to become, you know, uh, famous uh, globally and to, you know, receive funding and develop further and, you know, have a positive impact. So, yes, you would find people that are uh, well versed in uh, in uh, terms of being able to to uh, develop projects here uh, and also you would find a very friendly environment in terms of um, uh, doing business and setting up and developing and all of that uh, but so far uh, interestingly enough there hasn't been any crypto related big projects or companies that have come to the region in general and uh, Kosovo included. If they do want to come and visit and potentially relocate, can they contact you? Oh, absolutely. You know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm the guy that first spoke in the parliament about crypto and I'm the guy that first declared his crypto assets to the anti-corruption agency. They didn't even know what to tell me first. Wow. Uh, well, you know, but it's by law, all 
people in in you know public positions need to declare their wealth and assets so i mean i've been doing this for years but then a few years back i wrote to them and said i i i, I own crypto and where do i declare that because there's nothing in your form for that <laughs> i'm not sure they knew originally what i was talking about but eventually uh you know i i declared them uh corruption is a corruption is a very um big keyword and buzzword in the world today there are a lot of countries that um for good for better or for worse are talking about tackling corruption yes. and, and things like that how how do you tackle corruption and how how can crypto help well obviously corruption is a is a problem in most countries in the world uh it's a byproduct and uh, definitely it's a it's a problem in 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 our region and it's a problem in kosovo uh but uh, you know the the government does uh what it can to try to not only enact but also implement legislation uh, to to fight corruption and uh, uh, you know all byproducts that that come from it, uh, is, especially in the last couple of years, we've uh, passed very uh, effective legislation, uh, which is sometimes uh, very tough with regards to you know fighting corruption and especially when it's connected to you know um, people in power. Uh, which is related to misuse of office and uh, and similar. Uh, how can you use crypto to fight corruption? I'm not sure I can give you a definitive answer to that uh, uh, because you know you remember I, any even when we were talking just before about you know my my how I got involved and and learned about crypto. Some of the first things that you learn uh, or you read is money laundering for you know uh, illegal activities this and that. The fact of the matter is that that has always happened before crypto. It will happen with and with crypto. It's happening now, and probably more than ninety-five percent happens with cash. It doesn't happen with, you know, with with cryptocurrency. So the same thing, corruption and crypto. I don't necessarily see a direct relation uh, between them because you know the criminals will always find ways uh to you know violate the, the the laws so do you think that crypto gets a bad rap because people always are associating it with corruption with money laundering and with like the dark net markets and of course it used to be a lot worse in the early days but that's still what the media loves to write about but i agree with you that cash is still king and the the criminals will always look for and find the best way to do something and crypto is is not that way Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's much better now. You, 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 you know this better than I do. Uh, I mean, a few years ago, four or five years ago, yeah, it was almost impossible to find uh, a, a, a news item which would write about Bitcoin uh, without mentioning money laundering or, or darknet or, you know, all that. Uh, it, it, it's completely different now, I think, because a lot of people have more awareness about crypto. And once it has started to become, you know, news in a in a top uh, top media. Once you you had daily news, you remember when we had the big bull run in in uh, 2017, and you had daily news about Bitcoin and CNN and and you know European channels. Then I think people got more aware of the fact that this hasn't doesn't necessarily have to do anything with the illegal activities, but it's something. Uh, much more bigger than uh, than that, uh, but uh, it had given a bad rap because even from my personal experiences, when I was talking to people, uh, you know, the first thing that would come to their mind is, "Oh, but this can be used for for this and for that." Uh, and I think it's uh, everybody's job that supports this, like us, uh, to you know raise awareness and and tell the 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 our story about about cryptocurrency and its potentials, and you know, fight. Of um, the the stereotypes that uh, other people wanted to create about this. You talked earlier about um, remittances, and Kosovo has a large diaspora. Yes. How are people currently sending money back to your country now, and what type of fees are involved? 
You know, uh, remittances play an important role in Kosovo's economy to this day. Uh, officially, about 13% of our GDP comes from remittances because... Thir- 13%? 13, yes. Uh, wow. Because a lot of people still live abroad, they still have families here, and they would, you know, send money and, you know, invest and, you know, buy uh, houses or, you know, uh, services here and what have you. And apart from that, there's probably a sizable percentage of the GDP that comes uh, directly with the people that visit. Like during the summertime, you have hundreds of thousands of Kosovo Albanians that come back to Kosovo to visit their families and spend some time back home. And, you know, they're not sending their money through banks or through, uh, you know, uh, financial services like Western Union or what have you, but they would they, they come and bring their cash with, with them. Right now, I mean, most of that comes from uh, traditional uh, banking and financial channels, uh, such as the ones the, that I mentioned. And, uh, and you know, the, the potential for remittances in crypto was always discussed and, you know, it was always intriguing for me too. But um, uh, so far, I don't, uh, I don't see services offering that, uh, even if it's targeted to the, to the Albanian community abroad. There are there are companies, for example, Bitspark, um, yeah. in Hong Kong, and there are companies that are offering the ability to do remittances through cryptocurrency at a fraction of the rates. And you know, I know from my research that countries where there are not a lot of options for remittances, there's only one or two. The fees are very high, um, especially Eastern Europe and Africa and Asia. And there are companies that are tackling this. Uh, problem through cryptocurrency. I mentioned Bitspark yeah. earlier, um, Bitpesa. There are there are a few of these 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 companies. Um, do you see an ability for um, for this to be something that could potentially be groundbreaking for your country? And if those companies would want to open up the ability to have remittances from Kosovo abroad and back and forth. Would your would your banking system would your government be be open to that? Oh, I'm pretty sure they will. Uh, uh, they will uh, because there's legislation, as I said, which is quite liberal in in terms of you know getting licensing for for financial services. Uh, traditional banking or microfinance or or transfers uh, and all of that. Uh, the 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 uh, difference here between cases in India, in Asia, uh, and in Africa is the proximity uh, because most of the diaspora from Kosovo lives in in Germany, in Switzerland, uh, some Scandinavian countries, maybe UK and uh, in, in the US. Uh, now there's uh, uh, the, the traveling has gotten a lot easier in the last 20 years. And uh, you have direct flights to Brussels and, direct and where to, else? To everywhere. I mean, uh, not everywhere, but like uh, Germany and Switzerland, at least five, six flights a day, different cities, probably more. And then flights to, you know, all surrounding countries. And I mean, in the region, like Austria and Slovenia, and uh, as you mentioned, Brussels uh, and others. So uh, this has made it easier because, you know, Competition gets you cheaper tickets. People travel more often, and also I think the uh, the rates with regards to the traditional channels of transfer transferring money have gone down substantially uh, uh, in, in in the past few years. Whereas the mobility of let's say diaspora and people from India that live abroad or from Africa is much less. Uh, compared to 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 what the 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 Kosovan diaspora has, and this has hit, probably also hindered their ability to be able to, you know, send uh, money with uh, lesser fees. But this is not to say that, you know, uh, using crypto as a substitute shouldn't be pursued. Uh, the challenge, I think, would at the end remain with re- with regards to what I mentioned earlier, with the banking system. Because people need to be able to, um, you know, uh, change their crypto for fiat. They need to be able to, 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 you know, um, you know sell them and 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 receive uh, cash for that. Uh, because of the fact that we all know that you can't really pay much 
uh, through through crypto right now. Where do you see your country in 10 years from now? Hmm, funny that you ask. It's the same question that Bill Clinton asked just yesterday. Oh, what, did she, what did you say to me? This is the untold story. <laughs> so I ask the same questions, uh, apparently, as Bill Clinton does. Uh, no, he he, what, he what asked is, it in the main square of Kosovo. He said, you should ask yourself that 20 years have passed. You should ask yourself where you want to be 10 years from now and what you want to do. Look, oh, I want to hear your answer. But before you answer, can, tell me what Bill Clinton is actually like in person. Uh, I may be subjective because uh, I, I love the guy. Everyone in Kosovo virtually loves him. He was the person that made the most, the toughest, but most important decision for our lives uh, when he decided to um, initiate NATO uh, air campaign against Serbian and Yugoslavian troops in um, uh, March 24, 1999. And it was his decision. And that person decided to send U.S. and his allies in uh, war uh, with Serbia and Yugoslavia uh, to save us. So obviously he's a he's a hero here. I mean, you 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 know that he has a statue in downtown Pristina, and he also has uh, you know. I know. I saw that war. picture of. I just saw the picture of my my friend yeah. Peter from Coin Center yeah. took a picture and. You met with him yeah, the other day yeah, as well. Yeah, we we had a nice chat. We had a few coffees with with Peter and a nice chat. He was given a speech to a very nice event here called DocuTech, and uh, yeah, yeah, we spent some time together. So to come back to your question, uh, uh, look, twenty years before, if you'd asked me where Kosovo would be in twenty years, I was young, much more enthusiastic probably, and just came out of the war uh, with a lot of hope. I would probably expect even more than we have now. Nevertheless, uh, compared to where Kosovo was 20 and even 10 years ago, and where it is, where it is now, it's, it's um, absolutely amazing. Now, when you live here, and if you're just a citizen, you always want more, you expect more, you're not content with what you have, and I think that's human nature, and it's, it, I, I think it's good that we are like that, because that drives you to do more, that drives you to to do bigger things and to 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 have uh you know uh pursuits which uh may seem implausible but they eventually get realized now in 10 years i would expect kosovo to uh, be a member of the european union or at the doorstep of the european union uh in terms of uh, its uh, development i would expect um, um it to grow uh in terms of economy and uh, have a much more positive overall trade balance when it comes to uh, production of goods, uh, because we are uh, better with services than with uh, production. And uh, I would expect that uh, finally there would be uh, peace in the region. I mean, the uh, the um, as they say, true peace is not just the lack of uh, conflict. We have lack of conflict for the last 20 years, uh, but between Kosovo and Serbia, there is no real peace yet. Uh, we have an on and off dialogue ongoing, uh, trying to reach a you know final uh, uh, agreement uh, between us. And I hope. What's the solution to that? Land swaps or just peace? I mean, I, um... I think I think the the ideas regarding land swap are thing of the past. Uh, Kosovo has its uh, territory, it has its own constitution, it's uh, probably the most uh, um, advanced constitution in terms of, you know, uh, uh, liberal values of, you know, giving and supporting and safeguarding the rights of its minorities uh, and, and diversity. Uh, but I think that Serbia should be released of the ghosts of the past and, you know, it's very um, uh, ambitious um, uh, idea of dominating uh, everyone in the region and just, you know, understand that uh, we need to, to have cooperation and not conflict. It's not going to be... I like that. Basically, forgive, but don't forget and move on together, like similar to South Africa. Well, I mean, there's no choice. I, I don't want my kids to be 
you know, raised in uh, in uh, prejudice about about Serbia. I don't want Serbian kids to be raised with prejudice about Albanians in Kosovo. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, cooperation is always more important than uh, and more productive than conflict. I mean, if we just or remain hostages to history and who did what 500 years ago. Uh, I mean, we can't look uh, forward to the next five years, let alone to the next 500 years. Uh, so um, in 10 years, I'm pretty sure that, you know, I'm hopeful that not not in the 10th year, I hope in the next year uh, that we, we, we will have some solution uh, with Serbia going forward and then in, that in 10 years, people will already be comfortable with that and uh, move forward. But most importantly, I, I would like this to be a, a place which gives uh, hope, gives pride, and gives perspective to its citizens, and particularly to its young people. Emily, you've always been very open with me in, in our conversations, and I want to thank you for that because um, yeah, thank you, Charlie. it's hard to get an opportunity. No, it, it's hard to get an opportunity to, to understand you know, what's going on in the world. And so for my listeners who potentially want to come to visit, maybe relocate, visit, um, learn your culture, meet your 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 citizens and your youth, um, how can they contact you? Well, they can always write to you and you will give them my contacts, you know. Uh, but True. everybody can... Uh, look, the, I read the other... Follow yeah, your Twitter. I, I, I read the other day. I read the other day some someone, uh, I forgot who in the crypto space, and he said the good thing about crypto is that you know, you travel and you find you have ready-made friends wherever you go, because you know this has been a smaller community which is, you know, thankfully growing. And uh, as as you particularly know, whoever is involved with crypto and ends up in Kosovo in the region, I'm uh, I'm happy to meet them in person uh, just to discuss about the specific interests that we have uh, with regards to. Uh, to the to, to to crypto in general, but definitely everybody can follow. That's interested can contact me through my Twitter, uh, which is my first name and last name, Memli Krasnici. Uh, the 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 Q M E M L I K R A S N I Q I, and um, and also through my Gmail, which is first name last name at Gmail. Perfect. Thank you so much for coming on the show. This has really been wonderful. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me, Charlie. And it has been an uh, interesting talk. I mean, we covered a lot of issues, uh, and I'm I'm happy to be in your on your I, podcast. Definitely. I like what you said. Let's not be hostages to the past. But definitely, I mean, uh, that applies uh, to 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 everything. I think we can be hostages of the past. I think even with regards to crypto, if we're hostages of what we're used to in the past, then we can't move forward. That's why I, you know, generally I don't uh, trust the, the traditional economists to tell me anything about crypto, because they're not used to they they used to, to systems of of that we have that have been there in the past that are here now, and that gives you prejudice. You know what you're used to pre- blocks you from thinking creatively about other possibilities, and if we're hostages to the past system, then we cannot develop crypto uh, in the future and I think that's why we need to be open-minded enough and liberal enough to uh, allow other uh, opportunities to to come to us I I couldn't have said it better myself thank you so much thank you so much Charlie hey everyone thanks for listening new episodes of untold stories are released every Tuesday and Thursday at 7 a.m. EST on untoldstories.com Apple Spotify or wherever you get your podcast. Untold Stories is produced by Jason Yanowitz, Michael E. Polito, Reed Hannaford, and Riley Silbert of Blockworks Group. Our account executives are Gina DeFelice and Julie Muroff. Our content is written by Kathy Zolo, Ronnie Tishner, and Scott Offert. Special thanks to Wayne Dallaire from Jump Dog Audio Productions. And of course, I'm your host, Charlie Shrem. You can follow me on Twitter, at Charlie Shrem. To continue the conversation, send me some messages, feedback, or anything you want to say. And remember, please give some love to my sponsors, and I'll see you next week. Remember, strength in numbers and information is power.